Good morning. <clears throat> the scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and the translation is the First Nations translation. I may have the gift of speaking in both the languages of human beings and of spirit messengers, but if I fail to love, my words become like the screech of a cat or a yelping of a dog. I may have prophetic powers and the ability to see into sacred mysteries and understand all things. I might even have faith strong enough to make mountains move. But if I fail to love, I'm nothing. I may give all my possessions to the poor and give my body to be burned as a sacrifice, but if I fail to love, I've gained no honor. Love is patient and kind. Love is never jealous. It does not brag or boast. It's not puffed up or big-headed. Love does not act in shameful ways, nor does it care only about itself. It's not hot-headed, nor does it keep track of wrongs done to it. Love is not happy with lies and injustice, but truth makes its heart glad. Love keeps walking, even when carrying a heavy load. Love keeps trusting, never loses hope, and stands firm in hard times. The road of love has no end. The time will come when prophets are no longer needed, when people will stop speaking in unknown languages, and when the need for knowledge will fade away. For we only know some of the story and can only prophesy small parts of it. But the time is coming when we will know the whole story from beginning to end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I saw through the eyes of a child. But when I became fully grown, I put my childish ways behind me. For now, it is as if we're looking at a poor reflection in muddy water. But then we will see face to face. For now, my knowledge is full of holes. But when that time comes, I will know the Great Spirit as well as I am known by Him. But until then, these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. And love is the greatest. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. If you've been with us in worship the past three weeks, you've heard that same passage, 1 Corinthians 13, and three different translations, the NIV, and last week the message, and this week the First Nations Bible. And I find it's sometimes helpful to hear the same scripture in different translations, just new things kind of strike your ears. Um, so we're talking about the last verse in particular of that passage, the things that remain, faith, hope, and love, and how they can guide us and connect us and sustain us no matter what we might go through in life. Before I get there, I want to kind of summarize those faith, hope, and love. Before I do that, I want to share about another book that I read uh, years ago called uh, The Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lencioni. Uh, if you've ever read Patrick Lencioni books, they're wonderful for those who are in leadership or management. And this particular book is great for anyone who manages a team at work or participates as part of a team in your work. Uh, he, he, what he does is he identifies three key qualities that every good team player must possess. The ideal team player, he says, is humble, hungry, and smart. But what I love about the treatment he gives in the book is he does this overlapping threefold Venn diagram to illustrate what it looks like when someone has perhaps only one of those three qualities or what it looks like when they are lacking in that quality. So for example, uh, let's start with humble, the pawn. On the other side of the pawn, you have, if we go to the next slide, uh, the skillful politician. Can you guys see that? The print's kind of small, but anyways, on the other side of the pond, you know, the, the person who's all humble is just a doormat for everyone, but the person who has no humility is a skillful politician. They're 
they're hungry, they want to get places, and they're smart. And when Lynn Stoner says smart, he means not just like book smart, but people smart. They know how to move and make things happen. But at the end of the day, the skillful politician is not really for the team. It's all about self, self gain, and self promotion. On the other side of the bulldozer, the person who's all hunger, but no skill or humility, on the other side of that, you get the lovable slacker. The person who's nice and fun to work with, you know, but really, the lovable slacker is happy to let you do their work for them, right? To let himself be carried or herself carried by the team. And the other side of humil uh, the other side of the charmer, the person who's smart and can manipulate things, and then you go to the other side, the person who's who may be humble and hungry, but not very smart, so they're the accidental mess maker. They try to help, but they just end up creating more and more work for everyone to do. If you've ever worked in an office or in a team environment, you can probably identify some of those characteristics. Well, I found myself thinking about that same kind of triple Venn diagram and wondering what it would look like if we applied that to Paul's letters, and particularly to the ideas of faith, hope, and love. So let's try this out for a second, okay? So let's start on the other side of faith. Who, what is it like the person who lacks faith? I call them the doubter, or, if you, or the AKA, the fact checker. This is the person who has to check every statement they hear. They live on Google, like constantly looking up facts. They love to correct details in other people's stories. Well, no, 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 that wasn't exactly how it happened. Do you know a fact checker somewhere in your life? And then the fact checker, they, 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 they're, they're so important for them to be the expert and to be right in all things. They cannot accept things on faith. They can't accept someone else's experience. Only their own experience matters. The biblical you know, poster boy for the fact checker would be doubting Thomas, right? When the other disciples told him about Jesus' resurrection, he said, not unless I see with my own eyes, not unless I put my hand in his side and touch the wounds on his hands, only then will I believe he was a fact checker. He needed to know. Or if you need an example from contemporary, like TV, I think of Sheldon Cooper, right? <clears throat> the person who just has to be the expert who, who maybe has curiosity who just needs to know and have certainty around things and the thing about the fact checker is because they can't trust not just trust in God but trust in the other people around them trust in their experiences and perspectives their world gets mighty small they're stuck in the same routine they're stuck in the same habits they're stuck in the same worldview forever that's the fact checker what does it look like when someone has no hope? Well, that's the cynic, or as I call them, the killjoy. They're the person, if you're around someone who has no hope, they can take whatever positive feeling is in a room and they can kill it instantly. Whatever the circumstance is, whatever the situation is, they can see the worst possible uh, you know, interpretation of it. The, 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 the character I think of from, you know, from TV, I guess, is that old SNL character, Debbie Downer. You guys remember Debbie Downer? That's the killjoy, the person with no hope who just kills all the joy in the room. Uh, there's a Christian version of this. Uh, humorous John Acuff, he says, you know, the Christian version of the Debbie Downer, he calls him Jesus Jukes. You ever heard that term before, Jesus Jukes? He says, it's, it's any time, like, hey, the way he describes it, it's like, you know, you're in a conversation and someone says something that's inane or, 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 or you know, like, not, not that important. And then someone puts a, a holier-than-thou spin on it to suddenly, you know, juke and put you down. So let me give you some examples. These are real-life Jesus jukes that you know, have appeared either on church billboards or that people tweet out or, or memes people post on Instagram. So these are real life. So the first one comes from the season of Thanksgiving. Someone posted, only one Black Friday offers eternal savings. Now try this one for Christmas. Santa Claus never died for anyone. <laughs> oh, it gets worse. Easter, bunnies stay dead. <laughs> Jesus didn't. 
<laughs> and then this one, uh, some of this is an actual meme I've seen. It says, think you're having a bad day? Well, Jesus got nailed to a cross. How's that for a bad day? Yeah. They, they, they sound religious, right? They have the name Jesus in them, and yet they're just killjoy. There's no hope added in any single one of these statements. All they do is take whatever experience someone else is having and dump it up with guilt and pessimism and hurt. It just kills joy. If I had to think about who's the, the ultimate killjoy in Scripture, the person I thought of was Judas. Judas, remember, when the lady at Bethany anointed Jesus' feet broke open pure nard, wiped them with her hair and her tears. Judas watched that, and what did he do? He didn't say, wow, how beautiful is that? He said, I could have sold that perfume. We could have fed a lot of poor people with that. Wah, 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 right? And then at the end, you know, Judas betrayed Jesus because he didn't have hope in the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed. And in the end, he took his own life because he, he didn't have hope and the forgiveness and grace of God. When we lose hope, we become killers of joy. And then I thought of the person who has no love. That's the zealot, or as I like to call him, the flamethrower. <clears throat> the flamethrower, they just burn things down. And their need to be right and their need to win, they will burn everything and everyone around. It is a scorched earth policy if you get into a conflict or relationship with a flamethrower. And the thing about the flamethrower is, eventually, everyone who is in relationship with them gets burned, and they pull away, and so the flamethrower ends up totally alone. I was trying to think of, like, what's the contemporary example about this? And again, I went to SNL, and I thought of church lady, it may not seem like much of a flamethrower, but she was, she was at least, you have to admit, a poster Pharisee. And she would burn people all the time with her little, little quirks. I can't, I'm not going to do a Dana, Carver, Dana Carvey impression, but uh, and I also thought, and, and, and in a more serious, I thought of like all the, I could think pundits that I see on TV, especially on news. There's so many flamethrowers, and I think they exist on both left and right media. People who just burn things down, who are, when they speak, are devoid of love. But if you want a biblical example of who a flamethrower might be, well, then look no further than the writer of the letter, the Apostle Paul. Or as he used to, you know, call himself, Saul. When we first meet Saul, he is a flamethrower. He just wants to tear down the church. In fact, he self-identifies this way when he writes to the Philippians. He says, I was, as for me, I was once a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. When it comes to the law, I was zealous, even to the point of persecuting the church. As for righteousness that comes under the law, blameless, faultless. And yet, he says, I was as far from God as you could possibly be. So I think when Paul writes these words to the first Corinthian church, a church that was in disarray, a church that was in conflict with one another, he's wanting them to understand, I've been there, y'all. I've done this. And so he says, if I speak and the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. I'm just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith that can move a mountain, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. And if I give away all that I have, if I become a martyr, but I don't have love, if that giving is not motivated by love, I've gained nothing. He, he, Paul's basically saying, if you don't have love, everything else doesn't matter. I've been down that path. I know where it leads. Paul's heart wasn't changed. 
until he began to understand that God is a God of love, not just a God of law. Now, the Bible speaks about faith, hope, and love. <clears throat> These three. And the Bible has beautiful things to say about faith. Like I like Hebrews 11 that says, faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. Jesus compared faith to even the size of a mustard seed, that that's sufficient to move mountains. And the psalmists and the prophets, they love to talk about hope. Micah said, I hope in the Lord, but as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. Psalm 130 puts it this way. It says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. The Bible is eloquent when it speaks about faith, when it speaks about hope. But if you want to know where the Bible really sings, it's when it speaks about love. I mean, a lot of times we think about the Bible as a rule book. You know, it's God's rule book for us. But whatever he's, if that's what you kind of think about the Bible, it's, it's the rules. Well, listen to how Jesus summarized all the rules of the Bible. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. It's a relationship that God desires with us. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's all about love. The Apostle Paul never heard Jesus preach directly, and yet he came to the same conclusion. To the Romans he wrote, let no debt remain among you except the continuing debt to love one another because love, whoever loves others, has fulfilled the law. The commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, they're all summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Back to Jesus. In his last supper with his disciples, he commanded them, this is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then Jesus sets the standard. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for his friends. Paul, reflecting on this Roman, says, Jesus shows his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so from that act of love, Paul draws this conclusion. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God given to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so he prays for the early church. This is from the book of Ephesians. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's what Paul prays for the church, for us to be rooted and grounded and the depth of God's love. Then John wrote to the early church another apostle. Let's switch to another apostle. And he said, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is Love. One of the most powerful statements in all the scripture. God is love. And God's love was revealed among us. In this way, God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, beloved, since God has loved us, so much we also ought to love one another no one has ever seen God 
But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is perfected in us. Are these not such powerful, beautiful, wonderful statements? And if what John said is true, that God is love, then when the Apostle Paul describes love to the first Corinthians, he's actually describing the nature of God, who God is, how the unseen God relates to each and every one of us. So as I read these words, think about this is just who God is. Paul wrote, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not irritable, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I like how the Jesus Storybook Bible describes God's love. This is definitely a quote from a single word in Scripture, but a compilation of all of God's word around love. It says that God loves us with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking always and forever love. Do you know that? That you are loved with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what we decide. God's love is the primary word that he speaks among us, and it will be the final word that God speaks over us and over all creation. We can trust in that. A handful of weeks ago, uh, Pastor Glenn McDonald uh, shared with us a message about grace. It was a wonderful message about grace. If you weren't here, I encourage you to go back and watch a handful of weeks ago when Glenn was here. Um, he chose as his, as his passage one of the ones I just read, First, first John chapter 4. But he read two verses at the end of that chapter that I didn't include when I was going through that list. So let's take a look at him now. It says, there's no fear in love, John writes, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. After Dylan preached, someone in the church texted me or emailed me. And she said, I have a question about this verse. What does it mean? I mean, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm kind of reading between the lines and the email she sent, but, I, but I, I, I had a feeling of her saying, look, I still fear. Does that mean I'm not made perfect in love? And maybe my short answer should have been, yeah. <laughs> None of us is yet made perfect in love. We all fear. There's lots of stuff in the world worth being afraid about, perhaps. You know, there's, there's lots of stuff that we can fear. None of us has yet made perfect. But I think what John is writing about is I think he's talking about our relationship with God. And when it comes to God, we don't have to be afraid. We don't serve an angry or vengeful God, one that we have to be afraid to approach. We serve a God who came to us, who sent his son among us, who died for us. And therefore, we can have every confidence in approaching God and confessing our sins and seeking his grace and guidance in our lives. For God is love. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear punishment. God loves us. And then if you even go a step further, the more and more we trust in God, the more and more we understand down to our bones that God loves us, then we have nothing to fear. Yeah, life can be sucky sometimes. Bad things happen. 
but we don't ever have to be afraid for God has us. His love is over us. His love is caring and providing for us. His love will conquer all. The more and more we put our eyes on God, the more and more we remember his love, the more his love displaces fear in our hearts, right? My seminary professor, one of my seminary professors, Dr. Peter Story, um, used to preach or teach about this verse. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Story was uh, a leader in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. He marched with Nelson Mandela, uh, Bishop Tutu. He was actually Nelson Mandela's chaplain when Mandela was imprisoned. Uh, and so he had a lot of experience of kind of fighting injustice. And he said, this particular verse, he said, it's powerful. He says, but the inverse is also true. That just as perfect love can drive out fear, he says, he, he warned us, he said, perfect fear can drive out love. The more and more we're afraid of someone else, the less likely we are to see them as a person the more likely we are to see them as a threat, someone to defend ourselves against or someone to attack instead of recognizing they are a person to be loved. And I think about so much in our world, how much fear-mongering there is, and fear is a powerful emotion. If we let it, it will displace faith. It will squeeze out hope. It will drive out love. We have to make a choice to put our eyes on God, to follow the ways of love, to lay down our lives for one another, to seek patience, kindness, forgiveness, and forbearance. As a church, I hope, no matter what may come, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but I hope and pray that we as a church will always choose the way of love, for that is God's way, the way that he showed among us and the way that he calls us to live. So may we be people of faith, trusting in the goodness and grace of our Savior. May we be people of hope, trusting in the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit among us. And may we be people of love, trusting and the never-ending, never-stopping, unbreaking, always and forever love of our Father. For these three remain faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Will you pray with me? O gracious God, Oh, loving God, we confess before you that our love is not perfect. We acknowledge before you in this moment of silence all the ways in which we fail to truly love both ourselves and our neighbors, how easy it is to allow fear and hurt to drive out those qualities among us. But we thank you, God, that in our failures we are not met with punishment, but we are met with grace. And we ask, O God, that you forgive our failures. But we also pray that you take our hearts, that you turn them and shape them so that we might be better vessels of your love, that you might fill us, O God, with your love for our friends and for our family, for our neighbors, and even for our enemies. Teach us, O God, to see and treat one another the way you see and treat us. This we pray in the name of Christ.